Okay, everyone, welcome to this conversation. I'm so excited to have these two wonderful musicians who are becoming uh, good friends of mine. We're going to be talking about John McLaughlin, and um, this is going to be a very, very open conversation. We can say all kinds of things about John McLaughlin, especially the sort of inner inspiration, the, the inner mountain flame, as, as you could say about John McLaughlin, the spiritual aspects to his music and the legacy that that's, that that's created as a, as a way of really approaching music and embodying music. So I'm so pleased to have Andy Edwards and Phi with us. Um, Phi Janzek, is that correct? That's it. That's all good. So Andy is, um, is a drummer and multi-instrumentalist, teacher, um, very experienced musician and very, very good at talking about music. If you, those of you who might have seen his YouTube channel, um, particularly John McLaughlin, Marvish New Orchestra seems to be a real hot topic on, on Andy's channel. Um, and Phi is um, an, an incredible guitar player. I've just recently heard some of his music. Um, very, very interesting lines, like nothing else I've really heard before, actually. So, very excited to, you know, to just hear what you guys have got to say about John McLaughlin, and obviously the, the influences is, is, is very clear. Um, so, just starting, I'll, I'll just say that I discovered John McLaughlin um, in a quite a kind of magical way to me because um, my parents had a great record collection and um, a record player came in, in, into the house at, at some point because we had all these old records and then one day I think my, my, my granddad decided to give us his record player because he was tired of all this technology and he wanted to get a multi-stack CD player, which was the big thing back, you know, in the year 1999 or something like that. So he said, I'm tired of all these records, you, you, you can have these. So I got this record player and then started going through my parents' record collection that had just been gathering dust. Um, so when I was about 16, I, I read this article about Miles Davis and about how Jimi Hendrix and you know the how that maybe influenced him and the whole fusion movement how all that came through. I was a huge Jimi Hendrix fan, and I thought, well, Miles Davis, well, wow, that there must be something really interesting going on here. So I read this article and it talked about the Mahavishnu Orchestra and just you know different fusion bands. So I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. And then one day, going from my parents' record collection, I saw this Birds of Fire record, and I thought. Oh, that's that one from that interview in uh, Jazzwise magazine. So, so I put on this record, and I'd been listening to Frank Zappa, and I thought I really knew, you know, what the craziest, most intense music ever was, because I had all the Frank Zappa stuff. And I put on this, and I literally couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and my my brain was like, it, it was like, oh, it was almost painful, and this feeling in my gut when he would hit those high notes I, I thought god i can't I, I can't believe this music's doing this to me I, I thought i thought i knew what kind of really intense music felt like and my dad came in and he said you know what that that sounds like frank zappa but like really 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 good frank zappa because my dad didn't really like zappa that much but he liked this <laughs> and then my mum said oh yeah oh well that's that john mclaughlin record and so so and then it, it completely changed you know, for me, I'd just come out of school and it was like I learned in a sense, like the feeling of like being an adult, like being being a man with with them. With, to me, that's what it signified, a coming of age. So what, 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 what do you guys think? How did you discover, you know, who, whoever wants to go first? You want to go first, Bobby? Yeah, yeah, I'll go <laughs> first. Um, I suppose that I first came across John McLaughlin it was in this guitar book that was around when I started playing guitar as a teenager. Um, I think it was the only guitar, main guitar book. Is it Ralph Denyer, something called The Complete Guitar? I can't even remember what it's called. But it had a little thing about John McLaughlin being one of the fastest guitar players. I just, it just sort of, sort of 
there's a little picture of him. Didn't say much about him. It just had a little bit you know, picture of him playing his double neck. And it just stuck in my mind thinking, oh, OK, who's this guy? I mean, I was into rock and metal at the time as a teenager. So um, but I was sort of exploring other forms of music via, you know, just trying to find out what you know, great guitar players are around. Um, and, and I think I, I, it must have been the Guitar Trio album was probably my first exposure. I, I probably bought that live in San Francisco vinyl. I remember buying that sometime in the late 90s uh, as I was exploring. And so I got that introduction at the time, you know, I was just you know, starting guitar. I didn't know who was who, really. I didn't know, you know, I wasn't sort of knowledgeable enough to see who was Al, who was Paco, who was John. I just, you know, just this amazing guitar playing going on. Uh, and it just sort of initially just cemented in my mind as, oh, this is just amazing acoustic guitar player. And that was it. So um, I think it's when I was probably, you know, going into the early 90s, I started trading tapes with different guitarists. So one of the guitarists I was trading tapes with was Dave Kilminster. And he sent me in a mountain flame and just said, well, and Shakti at the same time. So he sent me natural hmm. elements and in a mountain on a cassette, you know, side one was in the mountain flame, side two was natural elements. And uh, when I heard, you know, my vision of orchestra, it was just something just clicked that sort of, it was like the music was familiar. It's like I'd heard it before and yet I hadn't heard it before. There was something that I recognized in it that was like, it was very strange. It was like, how, how, where have I heard this before? Where have I heard this before? And I thought, well, like, I haven't heard this before. I mean, there were similarities to some music. I think some of the darkness and earthiness, I could sort of compare to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. And I know at that time I was just listening to that constantly. That was like one of uh, my real formative pieces. But to actually hear that, that sort of darkness and the polyrhythms and the intensity played with a, you know, played with a quintet, you know, sort of electric quintet. And it was just, wow. Um, and, and I'm possibly growing up with Indian music as so my father's from India. Uh, maybe some of the familiar, familiarity was from that, having, you know, background listening to Indian music as uh, growing up. So I don't know, but there was something really odd that was just like, I know this music and yeah, mm. I was listening to for the first time and there was something exciting in that and discovering something that was familiar yet different and intense and I think what was breathtaking was the sheer intensity of of the performances as well as the 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 darkness of it so this was all of a sudden there was this this other side to John McLaughlin I was just like oh hold on there's, he's not just this acoustic amazing acoustic guitar player there's this compositional side there's this sort of vision that comes with him and and all of a sudden that opened the door and I think I went and bought you know my goals beyond and extrapolation and I saw that, that sort of opened the journey for me that getting that in the early 90s uh, and then that followed through because I was just about to go into uh, to um, music school in Vienna and in uh, music school in Vienna they had this book this transcription book of uh, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, John McLaughlin Mahavishnu Orchestra, and there was like a transcription book, score book of, I think the first four albums or something like that, and I just devoured that, and <laughs> it was, um, yeah, that, that that time in Vienna uh, was just like, yeah, just totally, it just went totally into this Mahavishnu sort of headspace. Uh, I also remember that. Uh, Every week we had to, in the college, um, play a different fusion tune, you know, that was part of the prepare and learn. And one week was Dance of Maya. <laughs> uh, and this was, I think, this is just like in the third term. So this wasn't, this wasn't something for beginners, but I used to struggle with that because, you know, I wasn't that great at the time at playing through changes and learning tunes quickly. Um, but something about Dance of Maya clicked. It was just like one of those pieces that I could learn. I think I was the only one who could play it at the time. Something about me just sort of, oh, this clicks. This makes sense to me. I know something resonated. This, this is how music should be in some way. And that piece of music, I remember learning it and playing it and being one of the few in the class who, who actually pull it off. Normally I'd be, you know, terrible and do all these awful performances. But for once I came up with this, you know, oh, I can play this. These polyrhythms make sense to me. This sort of... <laughs> all clicked so you know this you know so you know that was just a wonderful opening this um 
you know, voyage of discovery. And from then, you know, that's really informed my, me as a composer, me as a guitarist, that whole Mahavishnu. And then also not forgetting the Shakti as well, because that was going back to my Indian roots as well. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that's another conversation in itself in just that, um, that, that world of that, that playing as well. But it's funny because, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'll, that's my basic introduction to John's uh, music. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll get on to the Shakti stuff, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's so interesting hearing this because it's, it's so similar that there's, there's, it, it's not just a little bit similar. It's very yeah, similar. Yes. I mean, I, I've known Fi for a long time, but um, we've never mentioned this. I learned about John McGoughlin because my friend had a book, a guitar book, learning guitar book I don't know what book it was but it sounds very familiar it's probably the same one yeah and I I, I, I mean I, I was into rock guitar you know rock music heavy metal you know I was into Eddie Van Halen I was into um, you know Randy Rhodes Michael Schenker you know and you uh, you're really impressed by these guitar players you know because they, they were fast and also the tone there's a whole sort of thing I was into my friend was as well and he bought this book and in the back, it said it had a sort of breakdown of all the main guitarists. Does this sound familiar? Fine. It has sort of. It was like Eric Clapton and Richie Blackmore. And then right at the bottom, it, it had John McLaughlin, and it said something like the fastest gun in the West, or something like this, or the fastest guitarist in the world, or something. And then it said um, uh, a couple of albums, and one of them was, was Birds of Fire. So I went down to the record shop to buy this Birds of Fire based upon that. And it wasn't there, and I spoke to the man, and he said, it's deleted, you can't get it. So I then went to my school, and I started to ask the teachers, does anyone know? Because they, they were like, the young teachers would have been very young in the 70s. And one, Mr. Frizzell, who was my form teacher, he had heard of the Mavish Nocturne, and he said, I'll see if my um, brother's got a copy, and he couldn't get hold of it. And, and I was searching for this everywhere. And around about that time, so simplified, they had on the TV, uh, they broadcast the guitar trio, but it was Larry Coriel, Paco and John, live at the Royal Albert Hall. And I watched that go, oh, that, that's that John McGoughlin. So the first time I heard it, John, was the acoustic trio. And I can remember um, they played acoustic version of Meeting of the Spirits. And I was trying to imagine what that would sound like <laughs> as a band. Anyway, one day I came home from school and on the, on the uh, sort of mantelpiece was Birds of Fire. And I would got so obsessed with this album that my mom had seen it in a shop and picked it up for me. You know, uh, CBS had done a reissue, uh, a two ninety nine reissue, and I, and then Jack, it's exactly the same thing. I can remember putting it on, and a, after all this build up, you would have thought it would be a letdown, but it was a complete <laughs> terrifying. I look, I can remember just staring at the speakers, not believing what was coming out, and and I know what you mean, fight. It was familiar. What I think. It wasn't familiar, it was what I'd been looking for. It, as though I'd been on this quest in music for something and I found it with that. And um, uh, my mom's uh, Indian, you know, and we, I grew up in a pretty Western household, except um, uh, I got Indian relatives, so they would come round. And, and around that time, they'd all come round to watch Gandhi. You know, we'd got Gandhi on VHS. And I remember watching that with all my the Indian part of my family listening to the Ravi Shankar and and my mum had a few Indian classical albums in the collection that went they were really old they were Kuali, um albums actually and she had an, an album of Indian um, class, uh, Indian classical voice so I'd, I'd listened to those as well so I, I had that connection with Indian music which I still have to this day you know um, I had a, a really strong connection with that and hearing sort of heavy metal and jazz and Indian music all together, that was incredible. But there was something dark, and like you say about the notes, there was something in it that went beyond that. Um, and, and, and spiritual is the only word you could you could dis yeah. use to describe it. And I think that was the X factor for me, is there was something in it that I hadn't heard in in sort of um, rock music or any music before. It had it, it had something deeper there as well, you know. Um, and then it was it was pretty much an ob ob obsession of trying to get hold of you know back in the early eighties it was it was just trying to get hold of the albums <laughs> it was so difficult you know so yeah that that's how I uh, that's how I came to uh, the Mavishnu and John McLaughlin yeah yeah I mean 
I, I don't want to sound like I'm eg exaggerating too much, but I think that you guys, you know what I'm talking about because it's the same experience. But um, when you talk about the music being like familiar, sort of having like something you were searching for, um, it, for, for me, it, it felt like I was, I was hearing my kind of inner world, but being like played to me. And actually seeing actually how far that kind of world went in a, in a sense like the, these kind of notions that you have um, like when I was when I was really young um, you know I, I had a really strong feeling of this kind of like magic and passion that lives within us and at a certain age as a teenager I think you kind of like forget that a little bit and you you become more rational and you know and when I discovered that music it was like a reminder of that that inner dimension um, and um, I actually it, it reminded me it, it made me remember this um, this vision I had when I was really young I think I, I can't say how old I was but it, it must be one of my first memories um, that there were these there were these kind of like rainbow birds that like lived in my room maybe I was like two or three years old or something but I, I, I had this to me it was like it was real it was like these birds kind of lived in my room it was sort of like like rainbow colored like kind of like shaped like 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 herons like the heron birds um, and in one day they had to leave, they had to fly out of the window because um, they had a nest on top of my wardrobe and they had to fly out the window one day and leave. And I was sad that they were going to go, but, but I had a feeling that I would always be connected to them, that they would live inside of me. And I, I completely forgot about this, but when I saw the cover of Birds of Fire and then I read the Sri Chimnoy poem that above the toil of life my soul is a bird of fire winging the infinite and then I, I remembered the vision I had when, when, when I was young and I thought that, that this is unbelievable you know that I, I, I couldn't believe like it was giving me a sort of key into this part of myself that I had just forgotten about or sort of grown out, grown out of you know so for me it really it, uh, coming of age it sort of connected me with like my what I've felt was like my roots you know my, my my soul if you will but coming so my, my sort of childhood self it connected me back with that as I was coming into adulthood and then that sort of sense of um masculinity that the music has that self-assuredness that confidence of like following your vision and like moving forward so this incredible forward motion um, so yeah, so so to, to, to me, it, it, it's no other music quite has that sig significance. You know, no, no, nothing else actually represents that that to me. <laughs> so I've I've never really talked about that before because it's such a sort of personal thing. But um, just you know, I, I, I imagine you guys can sort of relate to that in a way. That's a that's a yeah, beautiful well, story. I would say uh, I, I really like what you said, Jack, about. Um, hearing your inner world being played back to you because I think that's what you know the familiarity is about it you know my you know it is something deep inside of you that's familiar and yet you're hearing it externalized you know yeah. you coming back to you and that's um you know it's lovely to hear your story with the connecting with the birds you know that that's you know that magical state as children where you know the there's that um you know, netherworld between the imagination and the real, isn't it? The, the, the imagination is so powerful and yeah. so intense that, um, and I think one one way of, you know, you know, what one of the reasons that draws people or, you know, like ourselves towards music or art in general is it's a way of keeping that door open, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you know, as education and the rationalization process, which we go through, which, you know, is good too, but can also, also consume and uh, negate in some depending on you know the education process can negate this other artistic side this um, um, this aesthetic side to ourselves um, it's it's becomes very 
valuable when we discover something that can bring that back into our lives and mm. remind us of that and give us back that inspiration so uh, you know that 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 story with the birds is wonderful to hear that because uh, and that and that like that inner world coming back coming played back at you because I, I i found that though i don't know what it was particularly i think dancer maya was probably the piece that brought something back to me that was I was like, I knew that melody already. It's like, I know that melody. Mm. I don't know where from, but it was, it's almost like it was a melody that was already in my head on some level, but just hadn't yeah. been fully actualized. Uh, full. And so it, it was literally for me as well, just listening back to my inner world being, oh, wow, it's, <laughs> this exists out there. It's not just, you know, yeah. like Andy said earlier about, you know, you, you're looking for something deep within yourself if you're looking for something that you that you recognize but you know that you hoped was possible and then finally you think like this is it and it's like this this sort of you know it's it's, it's remarkable because it's very rare that that happens happens for me anyway in music yeah. or in art in general when you have that sort of reflection back of something that you hold within yourself and it's like wow, this really resonates. And I don't know why, but it's part of that mystery and magic of, you know, discovering what it is to be human.